So hi, let me present you this time a long tutorial on the basics of chapter 2, which is the finite state machine design. Let's focus the attention on a key, a 16 key matrix key pattern coder, which is a typical example where you have to organize a digital circuit so that it works in a sequence of operations until for this time, you know, this time for obtaining the output data corresponding to the key that you are pressing, right? So this is a very interesting example because you can even compare it with the realization of the same circuit when it was solved in chapter 1 as a simple combinational circuit. So this time the thing is different. You will rely on the memory property of flip-flops and especially the organization of everything around a finite state machine. Okay? So the objective here is to invent precisely such a circuit for, you know, a target chip like a field programmable gate array or a complex PLD which is populating any one of the training boards in the lab. And the idea naturally is to follow once again the VHDL design flow from the specifications to, for example, the final prototype. This time we will focus in the EDA tools, Quartus Prime from Intel and Model C Intel Edition Lite. Right? So, the BHDL design flow is as usual, a specify, plan, develop and test and verify until the final chip programming and the lab prototyping, okay? So, if you have to talk about the specifications, now it's time to jump to Dixies and see what's going on with the symbol, some commercial chip examples, and which are going to be the connections and the number of inputs and outputs and what are they for, and then, for example, this comparison with the combinational encoder, and then a special idea and, and indeed, it is going to be a specific video recording on how to arrange a timing diagram related to the state diagram, right? So, this is the idea now. So, we will better go and jump to Dixie's. And, you know, this is precisely the P6, because once we have learned about the one-bit memory cell, now you will position the memory cells in the state register of a finite state machine. So here you are, the Project 6 tutorial that now I will go commenting like that, so this video will accompany this lesson. The specifications of this chip, you know, starts taking advantage of, you know, examining a commercial chip. For example, the Motorola 74C922 chip, which was it is obsolete now, but it, it is a kind of a circuit that you would like to invent, okay? More or less, with the same features. All right? So the symbol is going to be that kind of block where naturally you have these special signals, clock and clear direct, and then you are the columns which are going to be connected to the keyboard. And the outputs of the system will be the binary data or the BCD data corresponding to one of the 16 keys that you are pressing and the group select, which is going to be high, as you know from the previous example, is going to be high when you are clicking. Just if you are clicking, as long as you are clicking any key, the group select goes high and that goes at the same time with the, the binary data of the key that you are pressing. That's the idea, okay? So this is pretty much, you know, uh, an, a standard encoder 16.4 that we already studied as a block in P2. So if you like, you can go here and review it again to get an understanding of what is group select and what kind of uh, ideas are lying behind this kind of block. Another way to approach this design naturally is using a simulator. If you've got the chance to have, for example, Proteo simulator, there, there, there is a key, a 16 key matrix keyboard, right? So you can click 
and you can open the Proteus now and inspect that thing because it's going to be the basic hardware, all right? What is under the keys? You know, what is under the keys that you know that are going to be in this kind of uh, matrix thing? You see, you have in some way rows and horizontal rows and vertical columns. That's the way we are going to talk about that. Then you have that the columns go connected through resistors to the BCC, which is a one. And then on the other side, you know, you've got the intersections and in every intersection you've got a key and so there is a row so the basic of operation of such a chip you see you can remake you can redraw the level so here it is not important the level but that the idea that you are going to have 16 different binary codes so this may be a division or maybe the A. This may be a multiplication sign or maybe the B or the 6, the 6. So you can keep it as it is by default or you can go modifying to your convenience. So here we have replaced the plus and the minus by A, B, C, D, E, F. And we have left the numbers as they are. So in principle, you see, it is quite convenient. You have uh, row 3, the vector row, which is 3 down to 0, is row A, B, C, D, and then you have more or less the same way columns down from 3 down to 0. So how it works? Well, let's run the application so you can more or less guess what is going on here, for example. But before doing that thing, you see, you, you have a, here a decoder you know the 139 is a 2 to 4 decoder active law so you have a single zero at a given time and the other bits of the outputs are set high so this is the code that you normally will call uh, one called and in opposition to the one hot, one hot means that you have a single one, while the other three bits are kept down, and this time is just the opposite. Only one bit goes down, because you like to have a single ground connection, which is going to be the law, right? A single ground connection at a time, you know, a scanning all the rows in the keyboard. One row at a time. And, you know, you have a sequence here, and the sequence is generated by this other chip, which is nothing but a binary, and binary counter where you are using only two bits, the Q0 and the Q1. So here you are, the binary code 00, zero uh, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, and then again 0, 0, uh, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. So you are generating in some way four binary codes that are later translated by this decoder to a one called uh, code uh, which is used for uh, scanning the keyboard, right? So now perhaps it's time to stop the, the simulation, take a picture of this, you know, Let's take a picture. Okay, if I take a picture, I can use the pen and I can just draw here in this white space on the side of the circuit, you see. It's all the time the same, to have a pen and a paper to draw, like I'm going to do right now. You see, you have a resistor, another resistor, and another resistor, and another resistor, all of them tied to PCC, which is going to be understood as a one, and then you have the idea of the columns, right? That way. So this is the column 3, the column 2, the column 1, and the column 0. Then what you've got here is rows. One row, another row, another, and another. This is going to be the row A, B, C, and D. And well, 
doesn't matter the three the two the one or the zero if you are considering that this is going to be for example a vector right so you can imagine that you have a buffer here the output of a logic gate a buffer that is driving the rows okay and so you know in every one of the intersections you've got the possibility to have a connection if you press the key right like this if you like to press the key you will have an intersection crossed all right a short circuit between the column and the row so what is going to happen here well right look at this at a given time for example you have this code zero one 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 for the, uh, there is a time here as you have seen before for in proteus you have a zero right so what is this meaning that you have this zero all along the row right and what what is implying this well if you now are clicking for example the key uh, three you know the key three the one which is in the row three and the column one you see the, the three if the, if you are clicking this key what are you going to generate here is a short circuit well a short circuit you are going to connect you know this value here okay this value this node is going to become a zero because you are clicking is that right so you have zero through the key and this is what you've got all right a zero but uh, look at this for the same code zero one 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 if what are you doing is to go and click uh, you know for example with another color it's going to be better if you click this key down there for example the F what what is going to happen if you click the F and just generate the short circuit well it is not going to happen anything at all because this is the value one right and this is the same value one that you've got from the VCC so you are crossing two wires you know in one way that you've got a one here and you've got a one here so if you read there is always the reading of a one all right so when you click a key that do not is the, a key that is not driven by a zero nothing happens but if you are clicking a key that is just driven by a zero as you see here you can read the zero in one of the columns that's that's the way it goes right so look at this let let's do it now for real in this second and then you will check it in the simulation so what you've got here is 0 1 1 1 and this is exactly this idea 0 1 1 1 so you know you go with scanning codes and this is now what you are applying here and now you are clicking the three so this is generating this kind of connection so the column one you see the column one is going to be read as a zero is that so so this connection here all right here you have a one naturally but now because you are clicking the three you are going to have a zero so which is the code that you have in the end at the column side well it is going to be one one zero and one uh, uh, that way okay one one zero and one this is what you are going to get when clicking the column three all right that's a perfect example on how it works and look at this if instead of the two the three you are clicking the key number one let's do it in blue for example now the the idea is that this blue is going to be red okay as a zero all right because here you are a zero in the same row so now the code to be generated 
you know, the code in the rows is exactly the same, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, because you are driving the row number 3, the A, but because you are clicking the key 1 instead of the key 3, the column code is going to be 0, 1, 1, 1, instead of 1, 1, 0, 1 that was before when we clicked the 3. So this is when you click the key number 1, and so this is when you click the key number 3. Is that so? So that's the second, right? So very well. If you go back to Proteus now, you can see that very well because it, it, it runs for real. You see? The, ca the scanning codes that way. And then you can go and inspect what are you reading now. If you click the 3, you see? Now you have 1101, exactly what you have predicted in the analysis. All right? But if instead of clicking the 3 that I'm just clicking with the mouse, you see, I click the 1, I have this different code in the columns. 0, 1, 1, 1, right? And you see, that's the way it works. Hmm? And naturally, there is something fundamental here that you can just uh, analyze later. When, when there is no key pressed, if you are not pressing a single key, right, you generate all the time 1, 1, 1, 1, right? It is simply when we click a key that you generate a different code in the column. So that clicking is detected, whatever it is. So it is both a combination of the code in the rows and the code in the columns, what is going to allow you by means of a combinational circuit uh, inside of a finite state machine to determine which is the, the final binary value. Is that so? Because, you know, if you go back here to this uh, to this sheet of paper when you click the three right if you are clicking the three what you like to have is not this weird uh, one called code but if you are clicking the three what you like to have in the data you know the data the data has to be zero zero one one because this is a three in bcd or instead if you are clicking the one what you are expecting is zero 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 one because this is the binary code for a one, right? But instead of this binary code, look at this. You have two uh, one called codes. One in the rows and another in the columns when you click. All right? One in the rows that is cycling all the time, you know, it is, it's a sequence. And then just a very specific a specific code when you click. So that's the ex explanation. So if we continue browsing the materials in this sheet of paper, you know, now it's time for uh, paying attention perhaps to the real one, which is an industry standard. You see, it is more or less the same block. You have columns and rows, so you can rename the Y's and the X and the DCBA, you know, you can change that by your data. You, you, you have DA as, you can change it data available by group select, you know. And then there is a flip flop for saving the data when you have your finger releasing the key. You know, that is something that your system is not going to improve. In implement now, but later in the end of the page, yes, you have the possibility to do that improvement, saving the data until another data has been detected and, and the data has been acknowledged by, for example, a computer. So we will do that, if you like, as an advanced project after having solved the basic block, right? That's the point, because you see, this is uh, even, it is, as you see here, the block that you are considering is the Motorola 74C922, and this is another one. This is simply a data flip-flop that has these specific connections, okay? So, well, if you click the 
MM74, well, it is exactly like this, a 16 key or 20 key encoder, and it is like a real chip, you know, uh, electrical futures, uh, the, the idea of switching a key in time, you know, you have these kind of bone things here, and here in CSD we have a special unit to solve the problem of bone things, you know, uh, we have a kind of a debouncing circuit, down there in the learning material so everything that you have to learn about bouncing is there so the idea is to get rid of this high frequency noise and get a perfect pulse a digital perfect pulse that's the idea and then you know you have a kind of a picture here which is the block diagram that motorola is generating for you right okay or national, not Motorola, but it is national semiconductor. That doesn't matter very much because it's kind of an obsolete chip from a very long time ago, July 1993 and before. So, you know, this is for you to get an idea of if you are in the right way. You see, you have a two-bit counter as it was in our uh, simulator Proteus. We, you have this key bounds elimination circuit that is presented later in the learning materials you have this 2 to 4 decoder exactly the 139 all right so indeed this is the x4 down to 1 this vector is for driving the rows and here you see you have the y's which may be 5 down to 1 or 4 down to 1 depending on if you have four columns or five columns so you see you have the internal pull-up resistors that generates the column code you see one single zero at a time depending on the row that you are generating so you can take a picture and repeat this here because it's the same thing right very well you you can just take a picture and repeat the idea just to keep it in mind right for example you are driving uh this zero one 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 those are going to be the rows right so this is going to be a zero now okay so if you click the key number nine you are short circuiting this you know what happens nothing you see because you have a one in this side and another one here which is which goes through the resistor up to this point. So here, doesn't matter if you click this key 9, because you have, haven't have got a 0 now here in this row. So you have a 1. So this 9 is not detected now. But if instead of clicking the key 9, you are clicking the key 7, right? What happens now? Well, look at this. 0 is short circuit and now this short circuit goes straight to the y2 column that way okay so now the code yes it is not all ones as before but now you've got one here zero and one 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 if you have to consider 20 keys okay five columns so you see you have a zero here because you are clicking precisely the seven okay later in time you will have another code so that key seven is not going to be able to be detected as it was now the nine right that, so that that's the way it works so it is right for you to have this picture because you can go analyze and, and inspect the table or the way it works and then perhaps the future that we are going to have here, which is going to be of our interest, is what is considered, you know, the frequency, the scanning frequency, the generation of this one called code, how fast this has to be. Well, you see, these people have studied that very, very well, and they have decided that they can apply, for example, from 30, 40, 50 Earth up to 1 kilohertz to 3 kilohertz. So, you know, for example, the mid frequency here in this logarithmic curve, you know, this, this mid frequency is the right one, you see? Okay? For example, 
uh, this one here it is right or that one is even better you see so okay you have to choose this capacitor because these people are fixing the clock frequency by means of a capacitor all right so if you are selecting this capacitor you are going to fix an oscillator that is going to be 200 earth for example but 300 earth is the same as far as 500 so in the end is about giving the clock a value accordingly to this range of associated to the phenomena of clicking keys you know so something like that is all right so 200 earth is going to be a good a good clock for us all right so let's go back because now there is more details that you you can see you, you can even connect chips together so how can you expand that to have more uh, data capability you can do that very well up to 32 keys and, and and the like right so this is a very interesting chip so it's good for you now okay to be able to design it not as it it has to be a bright idea or anything like that but as a, com a conventional circuit all right a conventional circuit uh, organized around a finite state machine okay so that is when you can go and inspect the circuit that you will have in mind something like this you see the finite state machine where is going to collect the the sensors you know the buttons in this case are going to be the columns naturally all right and so the aim of the circuit you know is to generate the data and the group select and as well the row code you see so you you will go driving rows with this scanning code zero one 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 for to, to be able to drive the row a then one zero one one for the row b and so on right so four of them because you have four rows so this is going to be the idea here and you know that the column by the definition of this electric circuit when no key is pressed you will generate one 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 so in some way here is a kind of a logic behind this if you are continuously at every rising edge from the clock if you are going to go detecting continuously and sampling no that's the word if you sample the columns value at the rising edge of the clock and you get something like one 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 this means that you have a kind of a signal which is going to be called later you will see uh, row scan enable you this means that you will enable the scanning codes one per period you see so you are going to have a special counter which is going to be able to generate the number seven the number uh, b the number d and the number e you see all the time like that okay unless you do something like approaching to the keyboard and with your finger clicking the five or the four or the six or the nine if when you do that the machine has to do something different which is decoding the key in the corresponding row that is now active all right so if you've been examining or planning the circuit you know all right what goes next apart from if you like more detail on this this is never ending it's not another one hour but if you like you can be here two or three hours because now you can continue talking about the clock how the clock is generated because you see uh, you saw that the real chip was generated using a rc uh, combination and a block that was the clock in some way they fixed the value of the c the capacitor and they generated 200 earth and you can go as well talking a little bit about the power on reset but you know we will do that in another time it is very simple when you are just uh, connecting switching on the power supply you like to have an initial 
clear direct pulls and this is the function of this simple circuit RC generate the pulls active high to be able to reset the machine at the very starting of the time which is exactly for a digital circuit it, it, it is alive just when you power it up right so that is when the circuit has to start working so the idea is to apply a clear direct pulse you know to reinitialize the machine to a very well known state that's the way so if this is the circuit that you have in mind what goes next immediately you know is to propose as a first step in the planning section doesn't matter very much but if you this is the end of you know if this is the end of this specification section or the beginning of the planning is not that important the point is that it goes exactly here the idea of you know uh, implementing or figuring out or inferring how it can be from the state diagram view right it is going to be something like this right uh, you are going to go scanning rows row a row b row c row d row a row v like that all the time and this is going to be solved like that this you are going to go cycling like this when the row scanning enable signal is going to be one which is this and you see if from the columns you are reading one 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 which is the condition where no one is pressing a single key this signal this extra signal that you've prepared here to make it simpler row scan enable is going to be high right so when this signal is high you are going to go generating the rows this is your job so the outputs here marked in a, in a asterisk will be basically to generate the one called code at every road you know that's the way but if it happens that when you are at a given row someone clicks the key you know that has to be detected because you know the column is not going to be longer one but zero and so this signal row scan enable is going to be zero and so you will jump to another state naturally it's not the same to be scanning the keyboard than the code in the key that you are clicking so this is why you have to change the state and in this new state you have a job to do which is decoding translating from the one called codes that are the columns and the rows to binary this is what you are going to do in this row b decoding state and well you will be here as long as you are clicking the key because this is the, the right thing to do if you click the system has to be stopped until you are releasing the key because if you have your finger clicked for a while what you want is exactly the code that belongs to the key that you are clicking nothing else and that has to be here as long as necessary until you release the key and this situation of not looping anymore but releasing the key means that this special signal the row scan enable is going to be high again so for example you can go and continue the scanning sequence and this may happen at every one of the rows so this is why that from every row code you can jump to the corresponding row c decoding row d decoding and the row a decoding like that right so this takes a lot of time to generate this is where you have to think a lot and this is why it's good for you to have this kind of presentation and all the necessary stuff in this diagram it goes together you know how many transitions you have from one state to the next how many loops if there has to be loops all right and which are the outputs you know the outputs here are a lot of them you have nine outputs so in every state you have to solve the situation of nine outputs is that so so if this is more or less the way you think that the machine may work naturally that's the first sketch you can do that and later you will realize that something is not perfectly well running and you may like to change that so that's the process of design you do 
a faster sketch of this diagram and if necessary later you modify it as much as necessary that's the way it works but you know you have to have this in order to start for example to start what well to figuring out or re reinforcing the ideas that you've got from the electrical circuit and the state diagram you can reinforce that with this extremely powerful tool which is the timing diagram you see what happens really in time and this is the picture that you've got here the picture number five and this is well it's not simple you know this is not simple so the timing diagram it is it is something that here we have solved with another video recording right so it is not necessary to include it here now but we can skip that step because it's recorded already here so you click this you can watch the video recording okay because it's now when you will take a maximum profit of it you see and you know that it is very clear that is not a picture this is a picture right i took a picture of the final whiteboard but that's not the point because here it's a lot of verbeting you know it's a lot of wording and talking and talking about that and how it starts how can you continue which values are sampled which is the output and why and why you've got this and not that at this time and later so you see there is there is a lot of explanations in order to get this diagram and i like that very much because this is perhaps the the most difficult one that you will have to confront in this subject because it it is you know it is complicated by default so you what you can do now is to watch the video and be perfectly acquainted you can watch it as many times as you like well and you can watch it and naturally at the same time please take a sheet of paper and and try to get it in your way for example with another example here i assumed that i was clicking the a here this time you can assume another thing for example clicking the one or clicking the f what is going to be happening in your system so then is when you realize how it works not simply inspecting this picture and and considering that it is something that is uh, that simple it, that's not the case right well that it's all about the s specifications you know the s specifications and so what goes next is the planning but you know planning is going to be all the time in the same way and perhaps now it's time for you to go and solve a previous example if you need it right uh, an example like this the 16 key keywords uh, matrix encoder is not it doesn't have to be your first example not, not 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 like that you better go and solve a simpler example like the land the classroom light control a single button right and this is for example something that we will record later but you know that here you are in this kind of a stuff you have learning materials because you know it is good to go back and to find similar examples try to solve them and naturally i can tell you that solving the light control you see you have a single luminaire on the roof of your classroom and you have three buttons and you know this circuit is a lot more simpler to design than the matrix encoder so naturally this is something that you have to solve before or the lily bicycle torch you know why not this is what you are designing this kind of bicycle torch that you can buy very well by a very few a lot not six or seven euros as much you can get this device so how it works because it has to have some kind of memory you click the button once and you have light if you click again perhaps you have an intermittency or half of the light just a fraction and if you click again the same button now the it is switch off so you know this is again another similar example that probably is going to be easier than the one that you have in mind here which is the the solving of the 16 key matrix encoder right so now 
if you've got the basics and, and naturally that is a good thing to do here before finishing this i have to tell you is this idea of the you know the boot on the bouncer which is nothing but a low pass filter and as well as a synchronizer so you know you can go and study here by means of another tutorial in green in the same unit six because it's going to be solved in the same way as another finite state machine but you see now the problem is completely different you like to clean up a dirty you know uh, a signal with noise you know high frequency noise generated by the key so this is what you would like to get rid of in order to have a perfectly correct digital pulse but you know you can generate a short pulse short which means here in this world as much as a one clock period that's the shortest pulse that you can get one clock period or you can have it larger than that you can have it uh you can have a one as long as you are clicking you know so you can have the qa and the qb very well so this is the debouncing filter and the design in this experiment so you see a complex problem can be solved in a smaller ones and be better if you have a previous experience before on analogous or simpler or similar circuits before attempting such a thing as this one which is you know it's quite complex so this is why it's here because it's some way it's the end project of the p6 in between you have several of them right so it's all the time the same way and so now just another time the same way so now we will continue with the planning okay so if we have finished with the specifications now it, it is the planning right yeah which consists again in re reviewing the state diagram and then the next step to do is to go and customize or adapt the finite state machine then go and and tell and say something about encoding a state in which binary code you will encode the states it is going to be binary sequential one hot gray etc and and then you you have to draw the state register because in this way you have a good idea on how many registers and which is the way to connect them to have a synchronous circuit and then you can invent the combinational circuit one which is nothing but the state logic you know and you know that is a combinational circuit and you know that you can solve that as in chapter one by means of a true table and a flow chart a flow chart that is going to be later converted into vhdl and the same for the cc2 which is nothing but the true table for generating the outputs and so you have to proceed the same way getting a flow chart and then converting that into a process by means of the behavioral interpretation of the flow chart because we have still decided to do that among the many possibilities the one that is more convenient because it's repeatable and it's all the time the same so it doesn't matter in the end what exactly are you planning and developing you know that the method is consistent and repetitive and you know robust and reliable that's the idea of the way we do that things here we are like to invent circuits that work all the time so let's implement them in a very professional way all the time thinking and annotating the same items right and you know that once the planning the planning will be finished we will go and talk about development you know which is going to be the same another set of establishes the steps and the same for the function this uh, the same for the functional simulation you know so let's get let's 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 just do the a little bit of the planning just because again this can be a five minutes uh, thing or it can be a two hours thing this is a never ending if you have to talk about this you know it's a long long lesson because that depends on the detail you like to go here so planning you know consists of you know reviewing again the state diagram making sense of it again uh, imagining now the number of states the names of the states and so if you've got the state diagram in your mind naturally 
here we have a way to proceed. And basically, this is adapting the finite state machine to the problem. And here it is very clear. We are going to get signals from the column vector. We will generate this special signal, this extra signal. Row scan enable. So both the columns codes and the row scan enable are going to be inputs to the combinational circuit 2 and combinational circuit 1. Right? The combinational circuit 2, you see, easy. It has a job to do. Generate the nine outputs. The combinational circuit 1, instead, is going to be for generating the next state logic. I mean, if you are now in the row A, what goes next? So, what goes next, you know, after the rising edge of the clock, will depend on the value of the inputs that you've been sampling. One input, it is very well known, is the output of the state register that has been feedback as another input to the combinational circuits. That's the key point of the memory thing, you know, to use the internal signals, in this case the current state, as the signal to be considered and the signal that is going to be different depending on what you're doing with your fingers and the keyboard, you know. So sometimes you are going to be uh, scanning the row A, sometimes later you will be decoding the row, the key that is in the row C, and etc, etc, right? So this is the function of the state register, to keep a track of the current state as a signal. This is why I like to print or to represent that thing in the whiteboard like this, you see? In, for example, in different colors, I mean, black for the ports, and then next state and current state are going to be signals, internal signals of this diagram. By the way, in the end, this diagram is going to be fit into a single BHD, BHDL file, right? So we will have to invent the three processes here that will work concurrently at the same time. And you see, the state register it is not that complex because, you know, it is in charge of uh, connecting, is where the clock and the clear deck -like was connected because it's nothing but an array of some <laughs> D flip flops, right? So that's the mechanism, that's the finite state machine that we will organize here for the problem of the keyboard. So, you know, after this, you, you have a picture to invent, you know the the picture that is related to the state register you how many data flip flops you like to have here right but so that depends on the code that you are associating to any one of the levels that are the states so for example here you've got you know eight states so if you like, you can use binary code or gray code, which means that you will need only three data flip-flops. Because any one of the states can have a different value or combination. For example, the row A may be 0, 0, 0. The row A decoded may be the 0, 0, 1. The row B may be the 0, 1, 0. And the row B decoded may be the... 0, 1, 1, and the like, right? This way or another, you can use the gray or the binary. But perhaps you like to use one hot. If you are using one hot, now it's time for using eight flip-flops. One flip-flop for every one of the states. So you will have the way that means to encoding the states like this, right? For example, row A is going to be seven zeros and then a one. Row A decoded is going to be, you know, again, six zeros, a one, and a zero. So you are assigning a one hot code for every one of the states. All right. So this is something that you can deduce here in this section. How many data flip-flops you need for the state register, right? Then, what goes next here, you know, is the discussion about, for example, the CC2, how the CC2 is going to be organized, all right? 
and that is not simple because the CC2, you know, it is for generating the corresponding data output from what? From the current state and from the columns that you are reading, right? So perhaps it is good to spend some time here. Not that much because it, I, I like better you to print this sheet of paper and, and re redraw it in some way or another because what you see here is nothing but another example, right? So I, if you like, I can do that of taking some notes here because I can do that thing of save the picture as, save the, save the image like that. You know, I can save the image and now I can open it and use my pen to give you some insight on this CC2 design. All right. What is not, it's not the picture, but it is not the picture. So that we have to consider something went wrong, wrong. So let me see. No. So the picture of the CC2 is not here and I don't know why. Yeah, that one is clear, so that's the same thing. Let me print the screen perhaps like this. Okay. Just to give you some insight on this, you know, this is the this is the the finite state machine right so let's talk about precisely this block the cc2 so which are the inputs of this block you see the columns in one side and the current state in the other so you have eight inputs and from these eight inputs the current state and the column code you will decide what to do as the output. That's the point. And all the outputs are the same. No, no, naturally, no. So you can go and you can invent this through table a step by a step or not at the same time. For example, let's imagine the outputs row. So if you are in row A as your current state, doesn't matter very much the columns because you have something to do and not precisely decoding any key, but if you are in row A or row B or row C, you know, if you are here in row B, is because no one is clicking a single key. So it doesn't matter the values that you've got in the column. Okay? Because what you want is to generate the code B for scanning the keyboard, which is one, zero one one this is what you like to generate right and the data you know because you know that in row b no one is clicking you like to generate zero 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 and a zero in group select so this is why you can go and continue this thing in your own way but if the current state is different like the code in the row a this means that some someone was you know clicking the key and generating a short circuit when this row A had a zero. So you, you are reading precisely a zero. So you are reading something like uh, zero, one, 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 or, okay. So you can go and read the, the zero in the first column, the zero in the column number two, the zero in the column number one, or the zero in the column numbers uh, zero. And in this way, depending on the zero that you are generating in the columns, you know, you have to obtain different data. The plastic level associated to the data, the one, the two, the three, or the A, you see? So this is the true table, CC2. It's in some way it's not that difficult, but you have to pay attention, right? Okay. And this case may also be possible. If you are already decoding the row A, but the, the user releases the key, immediately the column 
will become one, 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 one. So this case is also possible when releasing the key, no? you right? So if you are releasing the key, you will be able to generate the same or the next code to go. You, you can go, you can generate this row or the other one. Doesn't matter because it's, it's not that important. And what is important here is to generate zero again and zero in the group select because the group select was one because you were clicking any one of the four keys, but not anymore. So you have to come back and generate the zero, right? That's the way it works. So in this section of the whiteboard, you have the same idea, you know, but uh, a lot better explained in some way, but it's up to you, you know, for example, here you are example of scanning the row one. So the zero is in this, uh, in this row, you see, here is where you are scanning. Now, this is the one which is a zero. And so if you are clicking the seven, the eight, the nine, or the C keys, this is what you have to do, depending on the column that you are reading. You see, it is possible the seven, if the zero is in this position, it is possible the eight, it is possible the nine, and it is also possible the C. Okay, if you are clicking the C, you know, here is where you are going to generate the zero. So this is why you've got this code. So from this information at the input, you have to generate this C binary or you see the binary code corresponding to the C. All right, so that's very important. Uh, analyze in detail which is the true table and what is important here for the CC2, all right? And once you've done that, you can go back to the lesson here. You can go back to the lesson, right? And you can do the same if you like, or you can just go and convert the true table from the CC2 into a flow chart. That's another thing that you can do, okay? And as a continuation, you can examine again the, you know, you can have to go up again to examine again the state diagram, but you know, this time not for figuring out what are going to be the brackets, the parentheses, you know, the asterisks, the nine values that becomes the outputs, not now for this, but paying attention to every single arrow. How are you going to configure every single arrow, the loops, the signal transitions, and the like? In which way? So this is the job, you know, of the CC1, to generate the, all the state transitions, okay? So if you do that, you can focus your attention again in one of these whiteboards, and you can proceed with the similar analysis, which are going to be the inputs of the CC1, and what to do, you know? And this what to do here is translated by stating the outputs of the CC1, which is nothing but the next state to go. And this is why the CC1 is going to look like this, you see? In the end, perhaps, once you've gone through this for a while, it's not that difficult, but don't, don't consider that a very simple thing, right? I don't think that this is simple in any way. But in the end, in this example, if you have to try to explain what happened with the arrows, you have to do the same thing. Why don't you go a state by a state, you know, row A and then row A decoded and row B and row B decoded. Why don't you complete the true table? But this way, analyzing all the arrows that are around the single state. So each state has some rows. For example, if you are in row A, you have two possibilities, depending in this case of the row scan enable signal. If the row scan enable is one, you go like that, row B, and the row scan enable is zero, you go to the row enable decoded. And that happens for many states. If you are in row A decoded, you can stay for a while in the same state, or you can jump to the row B or even to the row A, doesn't matter very much. But you can jump if the row A scan enable happens to be one because the user has released the key. 
So, right? So now it's time for the arrows, and the arrows means that you have to solve another two table like this. So if you do that, you will be able to generate the corresponding uh, true table, right? And then, once you've got the true tables, you can do the exercise of converting the true tables into, you know, flowcharts, or another name for these, algorithmic state machines, it is the same thing, it's just an algorithm, a state machine chart or diagram is the same thing. It is the translation, the behavioral translation of such a state diagram, such a table, such a true table into a flow chart. You know, in this way, the flow chart is ready for translation to BHDL, right? That's in some way all the steps that are behind the planning. Because in this way, Writing in the next section, which is development, writing, which is called the BHDL file, is not going to be that difficult, because you have both the two tables and the corresponding behavioral interpretation for both, or for the three blocks. In one hand, you know, you have the state diagram as a process, all the time the same, and in the other hand, you have the two true tables and the two flow charts for the CC1 and the CC2. So the only thing which is left here is naturally to translate that flow charts into BHDL, which means that, you know, going to another example and copy and adapt a BHDL text file to this new problem. All right. So the development is the next section here in the design flow. Okay, the development is the next section. You have to write the VHDL file, which is just the translation of the flowcharts. And once you've got the, the VHDL file, you have to pick up a target chip. You have to run an EDA project. And so you have to go through the synthesis process. You will have a, a schematic. And then it's your turn to go inspecting it and annotating over the schematic what is important. And then you have the technology schematic. And so you can figure out if the number of different flops are the ones that you have expected. And perhaps depending on the tool, you can even have a state diagram representation to check if it is exactly the same as you had in paper. And once you've got the circuit, the next step is to go to the functional simulation, right? So now it's time for developing, but to do that, you know, you have to go back to the Dixie's web because here you have the most important thing here to develop, which is precisely the translation of the plan into a BHDL. So perhaps it's a good time to inspect it. You can save it anywhere and simply to be able to inspect it in a colored way by means of the notepad plus plus. So here it is. Okay. The library. You are using the standard library, and this is the definition of the entity, the inputs, the outputs, as usual, vectors, and a standard logic. And then the architecture, you know, is a standard finite state machine, which means that, you know, you are going to have a state type enumeration of a states, all the, you know, all the levels that you've been using for every one of the states are here, and then you are going to declare current state and next state of this type, state type. In this way, and you can even declare the signal row scan enable as a standard logic, naturally, because it's going to be associated to an AND. So in this way, you can continue beginning the instantiation of the three processes here. One process, you know, you see, it is the state register. It is nothing but... Uh, uh, several flip-flops d-type and then there is the cc1 you see from the flow chart you see that you will switch uh, you, it's a big case you know depending on the current state you will decide what to do every time depending on the row scan enable signal so you have if if it happens that you are in the state row a you will do this ask for the value of the row scan enable. If this happens to be one, the next thing to do, you see, is to jump to the row B. But if the row scan enable was zero, 
you, you what you have to do is to go to this state row a column decoding to be able to get the code of the key that you are pressing and that goes repeated every time for every one of the states because every every state has different arrows you see in this way you are solving in a very convenient way without thinking at all about it the, C, the VHDL, as as I say all the time, as an exact translation of your flowchart. In this way, there is not ever a single problem here for you. All right, and this is why this kind of typing is not valued at all because it's simple and all the time the same way. It doesn't matter if you are in charge of inventing a lamp controller or a matrix keyboard encoder or a traffic light controller it doesn't matter whatever you've got in mind it's all the time the same way copy and adapt and adapt to the to the state diagram and adapt to the cc1 and cc2 and state registers right and the same for the cc2 it is extremely convenient again the behavioral interpretation so just again another case and depending on the case now it's even simpler, because this is a kind of a Moore finite state machine, you know? It is not even a merely machine, it's a Moore machine, which means that it's simpler in some way. Just because you are in the row A, you've got this set of outputs. Just because you are in the row B, you've got this set of outputs. But be careful, because you know, you know that from the from the true table that if you are in the state row a column decoding you know all right the rows are easy to implement a group select the same because it's one but you know now that you have to implement here the logic which is translating from this mix of current state and columns to the data right for example if the columns happens to be zero one 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 you know that the data is that one zero zero one because this is the key one that you are pressing or if the columns was sampled to be one 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 zero this is because you are pressing the key a and the key a has the code the 10 you know one zero one zero and all the time the same way on all the time the same way all right so you go and copy or translate that into VHDL and that's the end. Well, there is only one thing left, which is nothing but, you know, the ant. The ant that is as well in the circuit, you know, the circuit that you are translating is this one. So the ant, it is here and the ant is generating this signal in blue that is the row scan enable. So that happens here the same. The row scan enable has to be one when the columns is one 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 so you see this is a function which is very special because it has a single min term okay and has 15 max term so else zero right so this is one way to do it or another way to do it is just and 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 you know the same thing the same idea okay the column three and column two this is a little bit more hardware and this is a little bit, little bit more plan b plan a but you know doesn't matter so this is the end of the discussion you know and it is again it's the interface between the end of the planning and the beginning of the development because with you have this without this file you cannot even think about developing all right so you see it's a long discussion perhaps two hours three hours five hours for you to understand the specifications and the planning do not go faster do not copy this file even if you can you know forget this please that's not the question here do not copy this file to go speedy and very fast to the developing generating files because it, they have no meaning it is about you and what you understand here if i'm here explaining this in a web page and through a video and you know in a class and if i stay here 
talking about planning and understanding the specifications three or four hours, this is what exactly you have to do. Never ever go straight to development because you've got the chance to have the VHDL file and you can get results. You know, has this is the wrong thing to do. Remember that. Has no meaning and you will learn nothing. If you copy the VHDL file and you consider that you doing that you have solved already the specifications and planning, this is really a big and a huge mistake. All right? Don't do that. Here it is very clear that you have to stay several hours discussing the planning and the specification, right? For example, here I haven't got the picture of the D flip flop. So now it's time for you to write that. Take a sheet of paper and imagine how it's going to look like, you know, the schematic of the state register built using flip flops data type. And then you see there is another picture missing. Here's another picture missing. The CC2 flow chart and the CC1 flow chart. So please solve these pictures and then tell me if you are able to understand them so that what follows, which is the translation to VHDL, is that immediate. All right. And once you've got through this large processes, you know, the, the log, these long processes, you are able to develop and convert all these ideas and all these source files into something physical, like a real, a special, a real chip, you know? So let's go with the recording of the development. Okay, this means that you have to have in hand the Quartus Prime, for example, by means of the virtual desktop. All right. So now it's time for you to start a new project wizard and so be able to generate the project location, which is going to be as usual, L, you know, CSD, and now P6. And, you know, let me generate the right folder. You know, it is a good idea, as usual, to generate the folder with the same name if possible like the entity, so that way. So once you are in the folder, you write, that's the folder, you can, the name of this project is going to be the same, matrix encoder 16 key, but now project. And now it's time for examining which is going to be the top entity. And this is why you go to the web and download from the de development section this file. Save the link as, with exactly the same name in this place. So L, uh, CSD, and this is P6, and so matrix encoder 16 key, so this is going to be the source file. So now in Quartus you can browse, and, or here, you, I guess that is the matrix encoder 16 key, that's the right name. Well, let me, let me check that, because it's, but I guess that this is the name, right, given to this, because it's the name that you know from the very beginning of the specification. So this is P6, matrix encoder, exactly. You, you open this, you know. And so if you like, you can go and inspect the name. This is very simple. The, the name that you have to have in mind as a top entity is exactly this entity. The entity to design is the matrix encoder 16 key. All right, so this is the file that you have to associate as a source file for the top entity hmm, to your new project. So you say next, and you start an empty project, and now you add precisely this file, okay? It is going to be captured immediately because you are in the right folder. You say next, and now, for example, let's pick up a target chip, you see? That's the idea. Let's start an EDA project and now let's take a target chip where this project is going to be synthesized. So, for example, the Cyclone 4. And which one? Well, uh, I remember that the one which is in the, in the board DE115, okay? the one that you've got here in Dixis, 
If you don't remember that, it's very simple. You go to the tab that is electronic devices and companies on the top. And here you can choose from, you can choose chips or prototyping boards, the one that we have in the lab from Lattice Semiconductor, Intel, Shilings. So for example, if you pick Intel chips, this is what you've got. You can use a complex PLD, Max 2, or you can use this Cyclone, a uh, Cyclone 3. But, and, but you know, remember that this, perhaps this is too old, and instead of Quartus Prime, you must use Quartus 2 instead of Quartus Prime. But if you are now using Quartus Prime, you know that the Cyclone 4 is already here, and the one, the chip here populating this board is the Cyclone 4 EP4CE115F29C7. So this is the chip, uh, FPGA, right? So this is what you have to select here, uh, 115F29C7, right? Exactly the chip down here. Mm -hmm. So you say next. And now it's good to remember to attach here the Model C Maltera or Intel Simulator tool. And this is going to be a BHDL project instead of a very long. So you say next. And now you can, after keeping an eye on this summary, if everything is all right. You see it is a single file project again, as if you were in P2, now you are in P6. But because you are conceiving the three blocks entity that is the finite state machine as a single file because the components are not so but you know processes and all of the three are in the same file so it's again a single file idea okay so you say finish and now it's time for processing the file which is analyzing and synthesizing it okay so this is what we are going to do now. Let's click the compile design key. And so now the machine starts compiling the, the project or synthesizing and converting it into a circuit. So after a few minutes, what you've got is the... So those are the, the project results. So now it's time to, to keep an eye, for example, to the flow summary. And if you keep an eye on this, you see that you've got total registers 8. And this is probably because the machine has taken by the fall the use of the one hot code to, you know, give uh, a binary code to every single level. So if you have 8 states, you have, if you are uh, encoding in one hot, you have 8 registers. Something like this has to be inspected in the tool uh, RTL viewer so if you generate the RTL viewer you have a picture like this where these guys from Intel shows you basically the CC2 you see all this long large circuit here with equal and multiplexers and ORs and like this is for generating output right so this is all these blocks here belongs to the CC2 for generating in one way the, the data in that side, the group select and the row, right? So, and then what you've got here in this yellow box is the, the CC1 and the state register at the same time. So in some way or another, the system is telling you that it's generating one wire, one signal for every state and from these signals the logic is applied to generate the outputs and in this block you have the clock and the clear direct as inputs that they go to the, the flip-flops and then the columns you see the columns go straight to, to this circuit as well in order to generate for example the signal row scan enable so now it's time for you to click click and what you see is the state diagram like this you see you have all the transitions in this spreadsheet you see all the transitions between all the states and all the transitions you see 
the logic equation this this column zero and column one and column two and column three is nothing but the row scan enable so you see you have here perfectly well annotated every single arrow and every single state and then there is the encoding thing the levels row c and row b column decoded and things like that are like this you see some kind of uh, one hot so eight states means eight flip-flops one flip-flop per state that's the way that the machine has gone through this example so in the end you see this rtl that you can print and annotate and explain things like that that i'm commenting to you and then if you like you can switch it off and inspect as well the other one which is the technology map either one of them the post mapping or the post fitting doesn't matter very much but this is the flat circuit you see here you have the full circuit as well the primitive the atoms and the registers you see you have eight of them and you see them as they go colored in red every time that you are selecting so if you select all the registers you can see them all like this you see eight one bit memory cells associated to every one of the states okay and the logic that you see here now it's very clear it's a logic cell you know a luti a lookup table with a specific formula that came from the cc1 to table that is generating the as output the next state okay and here the next state is white is has a width of eight bits because it's a one hot code okay so you know that is that and and a lot of the, the lot of logic cells that you've got here is for inventing uh, exactly the output as you have seen exactly the same way in the rtl so more or less even if this is uh, it looks like very complicated is not that so in some way or another you have it all the same way as you had in your idea in your sketch with the c blocks but this time this is the flat one you know so this is in the end the full depiction of the 16 key matrix encoder as a full circuit as a flat circuit that is then downloaded into the chip all right So what else? Well, now it's time for you, if you like, to play with this idea of uh, encoding. Why not? Okay, why not? Why not? It's the time for you to see the difference in the circuit. Encoding in one hot that has been taken as default or encoding in uh, sequential or gray because if you have eight states you can encode in another way so you will have a different number of registers three for example okay so how can you do that thing well it's about the synthesizer right so it's a good idea to go now here and select the chip settings or the chips option something like this so it's about the not the eda but I mean that is about the compilation process settings, okay? So, if you see the compilation process settings in this idea of uh, with a right click on the project, you see, you see the all settings, so the compilation process settings, probably more settings, you see, you have a list of... Uh, the settings associated with the compilation process or the compiler settings perhaps you see the compiler all right so if you see the compiler you can optimize the circuits in many many different ways but for example if you have in mind something simpler like deciding to get a circuit by means of a sequential code or a one code hole code or gray code you can get the advanced settings for synthesis you see every every process is a different tap so it is a complex project but you know to get the the basics of that 
you can go let me show it to you cancel this is the the project navigator this is the cyclone 4 settings right guys compiler settings and here you see advanced settings for the synthesis process when you click here you have a long table you see wow a long table of predefinitions on and off and medium and unlimited and who the hell who knows so what is what you have to do well try to find the right one the one which is allow you to to decide what kind of uh, code to use for encoding the states so perhaps you can filter what is this finite state machine well it's not finite for example or state that way, yes, if you click a state, you see now it's been filtered, the long list of parameters, and now you have a lot less. For example, extract the BHDL state machine on perfectly well, because in this way you can have the, uh, uh, the interpretation of the circuit as you like, as a finite state machine, so you can have the, the state diagram and everything. Okay, then safe state machine off that's not important now and then you save state machine processing you see that perhaps is the point you see it's very very difficult to find this kind of uh, this kind of parameters for the first time as you see now right so it's auto auto means that the machine decides what is best depending on the your project so here if you click auto instead of auto you see you can click gray johnson a minimal number of bits, one hot, sequential, and user encoded. You can invent your own code, naturally. Okay? If you like to encrypt your finite state machine up to this point, you can even invent your own code. But, for example, to see the difference from the one hot that has been taken by default, instead of this, you can use, for example, now gray. If you click gray, as an option and you say okay right so now remember you have selected gray instead of the auto so now you apply these settings you say okay and now it's your time to repeat the synthesis process so if you repeat the synthesis process the machine starts working again and in a few minutes you will have the result okay right so look at this now to the flow summary after the second compilation the total register now is three because you have eight states and the machine has been forced to use the gray code to translate every single level into a binary combination of ones and zeros the gray code so let's inspect that now by means of the tools and again netlist viewer rtl and here you will find a similar circuit different but you know similar in some way or another the eight states are represented the same if you click click the machine you will have again the interpretation as a you know the state diagram the same kind of uh, signal transitions then the same number of states but now if you see the encoding you see only three states are uh, only three flip-flops are used because now the level row a is zero 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 the a level row a column decoding is zero zero one the row b is zero one one and the row b column decoding is zero one zero you see this is the gray code so just another way to invent a second and we are not going to follow now because you know it's it you have a different second and naturally you have a different rtl as you can imagine because if only six of three flip-flops are used you are going to expect a different flat circuit so here naturally you have only if now you see the primitives you see the registers there are there is only three of them you see instead of eight so the circuit is different completely different so now here there is always the question which is better perhaps which has the fastest frequency of operation perhaps so now it's that you can because you have the possibility to invent several circuits for the same purpose 
Now it's a good thing to ask which circuit is better, but I guess that we will not follow up this trail because it's too complicated and it is not the objective of an introduction like this, right? Understanding a few parameters is okay and there is no and generating a circuit is okay. So trying to find which one is the best, that's another level. Perhaps a master class or master studies or things like that, but not now that we are starting to use these kind of tools and generating these circuits for the first time. Here for you is right to know that you have the state register you know and then it's good to know for you that this circuit is nothing but a section of the next state logic right absolutely this is what you need to know you see uh, just a logic cell for generating the next state logic so this wire here is the next state logic right this is what you know and what you need to know at this level okay so that, that's the idea here so, if you finished with the development and you've got circuits and you have annotated the main details, uh, you know, realizing how many D flip flops and the like, you can continue naturally trying to see if the circuit works for real or not, or has some flaws or have some mistakes that you have to detect, or if it is working like the timing diagram that you sketched before. Okay, and this process, you know, is the functional simulation. So after the development, okay, you have to follow up with the functional simulation. And you know that this can be orchestrated step by step, uh, making sense of every single concept here, placement, routing, pin assignment, RTL, synthesis. But you know that the functional simulation is not that difficult because it's just after the RTL, you know, associated to the RTL, you have a BHDL, which is the circuit to be under test. And you are going to connect this BHDL with a test bench fixture to which you will stimuli, stimuli with some signals. You know, precisely in this chapter two, we have clearly two processes. One process is the clock and another process is the remaining signals that this time for example is the the clear direct and the columns so you have to imagine that the columns are going to be one value or another and let's see what happens with the machine let's see if in the end you can ruin a functional simulation and you can get results that are going to be watched in a logic analyzer wave viewer Okay, later on, you know that you can continue this uh, trying to test the technology view by means of the same test bench, but this time running the gate level simulation or perhaps as well the timing analyzer. So in this way, you can, you, you can go and answer questions, you know, which is the fastest frequency that you can, you can take for ruining the circuit or whatever else like this, you see? So, in one hand, you have the functional simulation with the main topics associated, text bench feature, test bench template generation from the Quartus Prime, the clock process and the clock period value, input signals for the process of a stimuli in the circuit and, and so on, and then the gate level, okay? Again, the same BHDL simulator, Again, inspecting waveforms, but keeping an eye on the transitions, perhaps to detect some glitches and false codes, and then measuring the propagation time from clock to output, which is the parameter of interest here, and so the maximum frequency of interest. Because after this, you can follow toward the downloading the configuration files into the real board in the lab and go there and make experimentations and just measurements of all the real circuit okay so now if you, you turn to organize a functional simulation it's again you have to have in your hand the the quartus prime and order you know from the quartus prime which is for example here you have to order now you know you have to start the processing of the test bench template writer and now it's time for 
copying this thing in the right place you know take your time go back to sim go to simulation model sim and copy this one extension bht two folders above and paste it in the project folder and now it's time for changing the file extension bhd and changing the name matrix encoder 16 key and now you know underscore test bench okay something like this so now you've got the file which is the skeleton and to which just this skeleton if you like to edit it it is very well to go to the web page and in the right place so before the beginning of the instantiation of the unit and the test you see this is the unit on the test before this you can add here the the constant which is the clock and where you get that you can get that from the dixis page you know dixis p6 because this is the software the tutorial that you are running down there after the developing you are already in the section of uh, you know the section of testing and here you know you can just open the test bench example to get the clock period definition. So you put that thing here, paste. So now you see 5 milliseconds is okay because you are thinking about 200 hertz as the frequency for the clock. Very well. So now you can replace the process which is, you know, empty. I mean the always and the init. You may like to delete that ones, which are empty by the ones that you've got from the example. For example, let's go one by one, the clock process definition of the clock, control C and control paste. And here you are, uh, you know, a 50% duty cycle, the square wave, which is half zero and half one like this, you see, clock process. And then, the other one which is in the fixture, you know, okay, the other process that is in the fixture, when I talk about the test bench fixture, I'm thinking about this picture, okay, this is the picture, this is the schema that you are translating now to become a test bench, so it is, it is not BHDL, again, I tell you once more, so pay attention, it's not about BHDL, it's about once more time the translation of a simple schema. This is the schema, the test bench fixture. Okay, two processes, the process clock, which is already here, you see? So what goes next, if you like? Well, the instantiation of the unit and the test. So this why, this device and the test. This is the chip that is now instead of a GK flip flop, because this is a P5 picture, instead of this, the component and the test, you know, this one now is the matrix encoder, you see, but you, you can keep the name I1. Then you will have the possibility to monitor, monitor the inputs and outputs the logic, through the logic analyzer waveform viewer. Very well. So now you see, you have the other process to drive the G and K and the click, clear direct in this G K flip flop. But now for you is going to be the process for driving some columns. So this is what you get from the web page file, okay? So when browsing the, the web page, now you see the stimulus process is exactly what you want. You copy it to the end, control C down here, right? After the other, doesn't matter if it is after the other or before the other, because all these processes work concurrently at the same time, because it's not, anything but I insist on this right so take it is nothing but this uh, a schematic naturally the the process number one and the process number two the clock and the stimulus both work at the same time as the device and the test and the logic analyzer everything here works at the same time once you power it up with in, with power supplies in the lab. So this is not the lab this time, it's something that you do in a computer, but it's exactly the same idea, right, and concept. 
testing something, applying inputs, and see the way it works in another instrument, an analogic analyzer, right? So this is translated into this convenient structure, which is using the BHDL uh, language or conventions. You see, begin what? Wait for a while with nothing, just launch some clock periods, wait for them to go some kind of initialization, some nanoseconds, and then you start driving things, like the clear direct equals zero, and the columns to something. This is a kind of an initial state, and then you apply, naturally, to start correctly, a pulse that is going to be the clear direct. Very well. So after this time, you will start driving columns, for example, like this, you see? This means that the columns... Uh, has this value, okay? So this means that some key has been pressed. And then, you key, the key has been released later on, some clocks later. Okay? And another time, some clocks later, you have another key clicked. All right. And the like. So here you can you can try as many keys as possible or as you want, okay? You, for example, you can determine if all the keys in the keyboard are, are performing as you are expecting, generating the group select and generating the right data, okay? So this is what you are driving to the second. So very well. So now it's time for switching and saving and switching to the environment, which is... Uh, conducted by another tool and you go to tools and run simulation tool it is the RTL simulation right so now is when you launch the RTL and it is the model sim in television uh, BHDL simulator so very well in the model sim uh, tool you have to start a new process a new project right and the project location is the one that you know which is uh, p6 matrix encoder 16 key so that's the location of this uh, simulation project so project name matrix encoder 16 key underscore you know as usual but now is a functional functional simulation right that's okay and the work is the work functional so you see we were we are repeating this from the p1 that's good thing because you don't have it's a kind of an automation exactly mm -hmm. so you say okay and now it's time for adding existing files and you know which one are those files that you are expecting to add here one of them is the matrix encoder 16 key I don't know what is this doing here. I should delete that. So, matrix encoder 16 key and the matrix encoder 16 key test bench. Both of them are going to be add to the system because you know, you know what you are doing. I insist on this because it's very graphical. You need the test bench, which is the top entity, the top entity with no ports. And inside you have this component. So this component is represented by a VHDL file, naturally. So you have the VHDL file, which is the top entity, the test bench, and the other one, which is the component. So both becomes now, uh, you know, if you like to call it like that, a plan C2 test benching. Very well. So this is what you are going to generate here. So once you've got that, uh, you, you finish this, you simply select the window and try to see if the machine is able to compile. Very well. So now it's time for uh, what? Go to simulate. Well, if you like, you can go to see if everything is fine. You know, you have the file here. Very thing. Everything is right. So very good. So now if you like, you can go to simulation and run or start a simulation and what is exactly what the structure is the one that you like to simulate the work functional test bench that one 
okay here is where you have added the stimulus to the system so you say okay and then after clicking this you know the visualizer the logic analyzer appears and now it's time for you to go to the work functional structure that has been completed here you see the i1 has a plus so you can go into the i1 to see more waveforms so but if you keep yourself at the top now it's good for a start it's okay if you keep yourself at the top okay with a right click you can say something like add to the wave all the items in the region top okay and the items in the region top are very well known for you it's nothing uh, difficult for you to understand that you've had the rows the gs the data as output so now you can add a divider which is going to be output outputs right so you write down the gs the data and even the rows if you like another divider add another divider you need rows for scanning the keyboard very well that's a divider so the rows can be placed down there and now you have you know that is a good thing for you to do is to to use the same organization that you have in the sketch and the sketch always start by the clock then you have the clear direct and then you have the columns so very well you see you have the vectors here so now it's time for what you can make that simpler and go to the point of you see that is important sometimes you are printing this in the wrong way if you print this like this has no meaning because i i have no idea of what kind of signals are those ones that you are showing me in the picture so you have to move the cursor to the right place so everybody can read you know what is on a stake the rows the gs the data the columns the clear direct and the clock so now it's time for you to run, you know, now the clock is 200 Earth. 5 milliseconds is one clock. So let's, 5 milliseconds, so let's run, you know, for example, if 5 milliseconds is a clock, 300, 300 milliseconds, that's okay. So now you've got results and you can zoom all. And here you are, right? And it has to be correct. Let's see something. Let's see if we see some things here. I don't know. For example, here, if you zoom a little bit, you have the rows and the rows are scanning. For example, the first thing that you can check here is to see, to, to verify if the scanning codes are the right ones or not. For example, here you have one, 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 one for a long time. So for many clocks. So for example, in this region, you see the output is kept to zero the data output and the group select so not a single key is pressed so what is what you've got here down there you've got scanning codes for example row a zero one 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 you can identify that very well and then the next if you zoom a little bit is better you see you have zero one 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 and then the next zero one zero one one and then the next one one zero one and then the next one 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 zero and then another time the row a perfect so the machine at least so you see we don't know yet if you have the right data at the output but at least the rows are right if you are not driving the keys detecting all the time one 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 so you know that the scanning code which is basic here this internal signal that no one sees, you see, the rows are right. So this means that the fixture of uh, keys and rows and columns are going to be correct, driven in the right way, you see? And then something happens. You are clicking a key, for example, the column number two, that is represented by the zero. And in this way, you see, uh, very fast, because precisely here you have you see the point here you have the zero on the rows number two so it now you see the key is very well detected immediately at the next clock so there is no delay at all here the next clock the key is detected the group select is set high and so you've got a five now is when you have to go 
to the keyboard and see if the file is going to give you that kind of signal or not. Because you see, the binary code is a 5. So now it's time to go to the schematic. Okay, so the schematic is here. So look at this, the 5. If you look at the 5, you will detect the 5 if you have as a scanning codes 1011 in the rows and if you click the 5 you will detect a code which is going to be 1011 so let's see if this is true or not you see 1011 perfectly well so if you've got this code from the columns this is because you've got the 5 and you have detected that exactly when the rows was driven by 1011 and in this way you can go trying many 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 more uh, combinations of keys and the like and very fine that sometimes the key is detected almost immediately and sometimes it has to wait for some clocks to have what you know now because it is was it was everything in the timing diagram you see you have to wait for the corresponding uh, scanning code in order to detect the right key and that's that's the way it works right guys all right so now it's time for you to print this screen zoom the wave only and just annotate with a pen whatever is important in this diagram exactly as you see in the in the picture in the web right so this is what you've got so this is what is important here you see not using text boxes I did here this is a mistake I should have done that annotating by pen because this is the way you have to do it right use pen to annotate and, and handmade arrows you know to annotate what is happening here you see scanning codes ah by the way you see you have here very important information you can monitor as well as the output you can monitor the current and next state which is going to make you a better interpretation of the results and an easier interpretation of the results you see the states here are something very important and they are associated to levels so how can you do that in your model sim diagram so not that difficult right you can go to the i1 you see the the, the menus the number of and the list of signals are associated to every lawyer so if you go to the top lawyer you've got that if you go to the instance one you've got all the signals of interest in the instance one and this is precisely the inputs outputs and as well the current and next state signal so you can drag them to the output and now if you like you can add a new divider new divider a state uh, uh, signals like this you see a state signals and you can move the current and next down there so you've got the outputs of the system and now the next state and the current state is that right so you need a little bit more space now yeah current state next state and no data because you cannot do that thing of dragging this here and that's all but we have it's time to go down to the console and restart like this restart it all if you like and rerun for example run for 300 not micro the milliseconds this time and if you do that you see now a new picture pretty same pretty much the same as before but now you've got here the advantage of being able to monitor as well you see in the cursor you can monitor as well moving the cursor through the signals the the current state at the next state and this is why you can very well follow this you see generating codes guys you see row d row a row b row c row d and then the next state you see you are in the row d but the next state is already ready already ready or not who knows that well you can know that if it's that immediate or not in the rising edge of the clock if you zoom this transition but not now you know right not now but through a gate level simulation
Okay, so before starting the gate level, because we have spent some time organizing uh, the waveforms, we better save them, because probably we can use it again. Save the format, you know, wave functional. Save the wave functional dot do in the right folder, and then you can reuse it, right? So now it's time to switch off this uh, simulation. And now again, from the Quartus Prime project navigator you can order another thing now what is what you like to order now well perhaps the transformation you know of the technology view into a bhdl file and this is something like a start eda netlist writer but remember that you have to do that with the information of the delays and everything so in settings i guess in the general settings if i remember rightly uh i have to go to more settings and not here i don't remember where is this you see you forget that it is in the eda tool settings uh simulation exactly eda tool settings simulation and now i like the machine generate for me all the listings which means that i like to generate you see generate functional simulation at least off in this way, I imagine that the machine interprets that is going to generate uh, the delay as well, the delay files as well. So if you say off everywhere, now you say apply, OK. And now when you say so, such a thing as uh, processing a start, and now uh, start the netlist writer, Okay, the machine start transforming the technology view or something like that into a BHDL file. And this BHO is the one that we like to simulate. In which way? Well, with the same picture, the same test bench. Perfectly the same is right. So tools run now a gate level simulation, taking any timing model, doesn't matter which. And now let's wait for the tool. Okay. So very well, start a new process, a new project. And now it's going to be in the same folder as always. So the folder is uh, that one matrix encoder 16 key. That's the right name. Very well, and now the project name is the same entity to be tested, but now it's going to be gate level simulation. And the work is going to be the gate level. Very well, so you say click OK. And now is when you have to add files, but from this level, you have to add only the test bench. All right, the test bench is, yes, at this level, at this folder. But now you know that the file to be tested, the unit under test, is in another folder, because this time we have not copied it or whatever. We have to go down there in the simulation model sim and take the BHO and take, as you like, the, the file of interest in time that is not here so i did it wrongly and has not been saved correctly so i will open this now okay okay so you see i've got a problem here or something so i will so let's see i've got the test bench and the bho the architecture of the component and the test. So now it is time for a start the simulation, which will consist of uh, going to the library gate level and taking this entity, right? Which is called matrix encoder 16 key BHT copy. Let's copy this name. And we will associate this entity with the right 
delay file, standard delay file, which is uh, set in here, and it is matrix encoder 16 key BHD SDO, the standard delay output file. So we click it, open it, and now we will apply this file to the region which the region which is this test bench slash i1 as usual right so we we say okay and now so everything is right so we go and say okay and let's hope that it works so finally you have an empty instrument again so now it's time perhaps to go and spit the simulation like this you go to uh load a macro file and the macro file is the wave funk and this is very good because you've got the state signals are not any longer necessary because they are wires now simple wires and there is not a simple way to see which they are well un unless you stay here a, a little more time trying to identify them through the system but because now it's a flat circuit so doesn't matter. We have the clock, the clear direct, the columns, the data, the GS, and the rows. So we can run the simulation the same, you know. Run 300 mic no milliseconds, and in this way we can zoom it all, and that's the second. You see, it it looks like that you've got some glitches or who knows. You see, and undetermined signals. So undetermined signals for a long while. So you see, before before the initialization, it is uh, weird, you know. This is why we have this time here when we apply a clear direct signal to make it easy. And from now on, you see exactly this time, we are in the row A state. And everything else is okay. The output is zero and the group select is zero. You see, before that time it was indetermined, who knows why, but whatever, doesn't matter. From now on is very well the value we like. And then at every clock we have a new value. But that that goes like that all the time. But you know you now you know that you can zoom anytime you like. For example, here you can go zooming specifically you see this is that you are releasing the key okay okay you release the key previously here here is when you release the key or when you click the key here that's the point here mm, i'm just in the middle of something so it's not dif it's difficult to understand what happens here you see you have a key clicked and here the key is released very well okay the key is released now and yes so here is when uh, group select goes down okay retaking the scanning very well so if you zoom this transition you have to see it in time but you know you have to zoom a lot because you were in the range of milliseconds and you have to go a million times in, in and in and in and in it's a long zoom in you see and now here is the clock signal rising edge and this is what you've got here you see the the gs that instead of the, this this time it takes a while this is a propagation delay from clock to output this is the one cursor at this point and then another one when the signals get stable so you see that's the eight nanoseconds time that it takes to get the results and that is different in every transition and probably you have some weird uh, states in the middle you see if you zoom that much you go from the rows right the rows that you know that they are always uh, one called code one zero one one or one one zero one but you see what has happened here you've got an invalid or false code for a while not all that much time but well you can see that this code shouldn't be here but is here because the signals are propagating through the circuit so you see, for some picoseconds, you've got that 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 thing. So you can do that many times if you like. 
and you can see what is this thing that you see here what is this teeny sometimes you have artifacts from the simulator that simulator that are not real for example what is this thing here that you've got in this transition a pike what is this spike about the pike in gs that shouldn't be here so it is you are zooming 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 in this transition now what you see you have a little pike that's it you see it exists for a very brief period of time but you know well that's the real circuit that is something that you cannot see in the functional simulation so from this data that you get from this real uh, simulation you can infer which is the maximum frequency of operation right so that's the end of the uh, gate level naturally taking a picture and making a notation for example of the time of interest okay going to a given transition and you know here the zoom all have no interest if you are at the gate level so don't do that of repeating this but here the purpose is to focus your attention in a single transition doesn't matter very much which and make the measurements of the propagation delay for this real target chip and now you may say that if you recompile this with another internal encoding and having for example eight flip-flops instead of three or recompiling this for another target chip of another technology or another branch for example instead of intel so it let it be shilings or lattice probably the delays and the final circuit is a slightly different naturally right so this is what you can do here and the final notes from this uh, project can be precisely the measurement or the calculation of the maximum frequency of operation and to do that you have to give another order for example the start the timing analyzer which is generating this large spreadsheet calculating absolutely everything that you don't have to know naturally but you have to go to the point which is just running the tool you know run the timing analyzer and go to, for example to the data sheet because this is a data of interest of everybody so you go to the data sheet you see and in the data sheet you run the data sheet report so the machine is running and you have a lot of reports here and the one that you have interest is about you know uh i never remember that so you have to go straight not the slacks device specific the diagnostics uh, no the diagnostics so which is the, ah yeah i know it is down there you see the report it is the data sheet yes very well but you know you are going to watch not the setup the setup times associated to the flip-flop or the whole times the minimum time that you have to have the input of the flip-flop is stable but you see you better click on the clock to output times that is what is of interest here or the propagation delay you know from one input to another but you know that this time when you are working with synchronous circuits this measure is okay the clock to output time for example you are driving the clock rising edge you know and from the clock to the data you know that it takes 10 milliseconds uh, to, to or fall or rise so you can organize that so you see uh, the worst case scenario from this list i see that is 10.709 you see so 10.7 nanoseconds is the worst case scenario so this means a rising edge in the clock and the data one is the one that is going to be to, to take that time to to chase so now if you've got this this annotation you can print the screen you know again you can take a picture of this and now it's time for generating you know the max frequency is approximately one divided by this uh, propagation time clock to output so let it be one divided by 
0.09 nanoseconds and this is exactly if you are using the calculator so 10.709 nanoseconds all right so this is exactly 93.93.38 mega air so this is the maximum frequency for driving the clock you know here there is not a problem in this application because the clock is driven using 200 earth only you see but you can speed up the circuit if you like not this application because it has no meaning but another one that you like for this fpga if you like for another cyclone for application you can speed up the clock up to this point all right so well this circuit will work the same if you like to drive the clock at this frequency of practically 100 megahertz all right so that's the end of the test benching process and now the only thing left is go finishing and before going to the end why don't you report all these things so this may be a very long report if you like you can talk about everything here because it's a full lesson and it has as well this prototyping issue you know if you see the panorama that you've gone through now it looks like that you are down here in the functional gate level you know you've finished measuring the maximum frequency of operation so now you can go to the chip programming so if we were in the lab we can solve this thing which is the adaptations for a given board assign pins to inputs and outputs and the keyboard and generate another top entity which will contain the clock generator all right and then download the configuration files to the chip and experiment with the board so this is what you have here explained this time in this picture you see that was downloaded into not into an intel board but into a board that was from germany but it has a lattice chip a complex pld the isp match for 128v this chip is the one that contains all the matrix encoder applications so you see you have your keyboard you have the that way soldering that's okay it's not a problem you can solder the resistors so you have the wires four wires for the rows four wires for the columns and the power supply and the ground so you have this interface okay with the prototyping and soldering printed circuit board it's not a problem and then you you have one of the ports here on the side of the board to make such connections so now because everything is connected you can go and run the final test so this is what you've got here the prototyping explanation of everything the top schematic the board the schematic the new rtlvu and the like how the circuit changes you know the segments for example because now you like to see the data in the bcd transferred to seven segment because it's there in the in the board the same thing as the you know the constraints editor to fix the pin for every one of the inputs and outputs you see for example here you have to take the clock input from to have to connect it to the pin 89 and from this clock input for example one megahertz you have to generate the 200 hertz by means of a clock generator that is something that we will solve later in p8 okay so in the end you go finishing this and you download you see you can go and click that word exactly in this uh, application you simply say go this is the is isp bm system uh, that is used uh, to download the application into the real chip the chip is the device lc4128 v right so very well so in the end you even have a recording if you like to launch it 
So if you have a recording to see that for real, so that's the final explanation today. You see, recording a recording. You click buttons, and what you see is the key that you are pressing. Five, five, the one, one, and the little lady, the little lady down there, the decimal point is the GS, you see? And what you see on the side is the scanning codes and the binary combinations. So that's a simple video of two seconds to see that you have invented something for real, which is the point here in CSD. If we are here investing that time from the beginning to the end, is to be able to tell anyone, right, that you are an engineer capable of inventing real chips. All right, guys? So, thank you.